Happy Valentine's Day, if this video premieres on the right day, that is. Uh, it's the season of love and relationships, and it's the perfect time to talk about something that has all that ooey-gooey romance, but also something that inevitably makes us cry. Why is it that we must watch something that gives us tears? We as a people are so used to having our hearts broken, even if everything is working out perfectly. Um, well, as you can tell from my infinity bracelet, we're talking about the fault in our stars. Yes, the perks of being a wallflower truly walked so the fault in our stars could run. It's about Shailene Woodley's character, Hazel Grace, who, based on the opening scene, lives right next door to the 20th Century Fox logo. She's had thyroid cancer since being a child, and has luckily survived this long with her loving family. And while at a support group meeting, she meets Gus, who lost a leg to bone cancer. From there, they spark a romance that every teenager has envisioned in their greatest fantasies. They're perfect, okay? Hazel is easygoing and smart, and Gus is outgoing and charming. He's overly charming. He's the embodiment of the perfect boy. He's funny. He's cool. He turns every little bit of life into an exciting, memorable moment. I admit it. I love him. Honestly, romance isn't usually my type of genre. I dig rom-coms, but this type of movie that seems to grow from the popularity of Nicholas Sparks has never been a go-to for me. It's a little too feel-good, and the conflicts are forced. When I originally watched this, I didn't think I'd have much to look forward to, but I ended up enjoying it. It helps that the main leads have good chemistry, and the relationship is pretty believable. I guess because of the context of the story, it doesn't attempt to become a romanticized teen fantasy, because both the characters have dealt with cancer. They've already been growing in a world of reality, so they just love each other, but don't have contrived problems or discussions of their adult futures. In teen romance, it's that stuff that always gets ridiculous, so I have to give major props to how legit the interactions are, and it doesn't rely on this forced drama. I haven't seen many teen movies deal with cancer, and I'm not sure what the standard approach should be, but here they talk about the idea of death and what happens after you die. They have worries, they make humorous remarks, they talk about the technical aspects, but also the randomness of being inflicted. I think everyone knows someone who's had cancer, so it's an issue that a lot of people experience directly or indirectly. But not too many movies speak so plainly about it, especially ones targeted at an adolescent audience. However, it has a lot of fun with the characters as well, really taking in the spirit of other great generational films. The 80s had John Hughes, the 90s had Clueless, the 2000s had Mean Girls, I guess the 2010s have something like this. All of these are directly tied to their individual decades, but they're still timeless, and speak to the concerns of young people, even if the experiences aren't quite the same. The Fault in Our Stars will probably be cherished in the same way. I never read the book, so I can't say how good of an adaptation it is, but I do know that this became quite the punching bag for comedy in general ever since it was released, usually in relation to the teenagers who love it and the overt melodramatic tone that comes across as manipulative. I can't deny that there is a manipulative angle to it all, as many of these teenage romances usually do. Because while I think it handles the serious subject matter in an effective way, I can't say it's 100% focused. Towards the end, a character dies, and I start to ponder if the subject matter was only introduced because there needed to be a tragic ending. I only ask this because while everything is handled pretty seriously at the beginning, and the second act, has a conflict where Hazel has a rising issue with her cancer, and the doctors explain she shouldn't be traveling anywhere, especially not Amsterdam, where she was hoping to meet her favorite author. This is done to worry the viewer, because there's suddenly a roadblock between Hazel and her dream destination. But through almost no struggle, she's able to go anyways. After this, that serious issue that her parents had to drive her in the middle of the night to the hospital for and almost had to cancel her trip because of is never brought up again. So what was the point of that? It used her condition to put a conflict into the narrative. 
That's how normal stories are written, but you can't just pick up and drop these conflicts without any explanation, because it isn't natural. Then, one of the characters die. It's very sad, and the reactions are pulled off well, but again, it feels a bit manipulative, because it's very tragic, but there was almost no prior buildup to this happening. Or at least, it only shows up in the third act, and it's not talked about earlier in the film, even though it probably could have been. Nevertheless, I'm only touching upon the aspects that have made people argue that this is a manipulative piece, because for the most part, I don't agree. There's these few moments, but otherwise, the whole piece is pretty genuine. The best emotions come from the parents played by Laura Dern and Sam Trammell. You can sense their sadness at the inevitable, and they drop some of the saddest lines. I also really like when they visit the author, played by Willem Dafoe. It really messes with expectations, because he doesn't end up being inspirational or extra kind due to Hazel's cancer. He's extremely mean, but it offers some of the most poignant dialogue. It's almost a shocking twist that disappoints the main characters, leaving Hazel's questions unanswered, and it puts them in a position to find their own meaning in life, which I think is excellently capped with the final monologue. My only criticism is that the author shouldn't have returned for the finale. I don't think it was necessary, and it still left everything with the same unresolved feeling we had when we saw him in Amsterdam, so it's almost pointless. I know the screenplay has a reason for him to appear, but I just don't think it needed to be done this way. I'm not sure what the intention was. Overall, it's a mostly effective teenage romance. I dug it. And since we all collectively want to fall in love while crying towards the end, I guess this would be the perfect movie to watch on this special day with that special someone. But if you happen to be alone this time of year, hey, still, happy Valentine's Day. I got one better for you to watch, The Nice Guys. It's a great movie, a great everything, and it has just as lovable of a leading couple. Special thanks to Anna for this Patreon request. Thanks for watching the video, and special shout out to Anthony, Anna, Kirsten, Lucas, Ryan, and Robert for the support on Patreon. By joining my Patreon, you can get exclusive videos and blogs, and for only $7, you can request your own movie review. I hope you stick around, cinephile, and have a happy, productive day.